Welcome to a new episode of Whiplash Agile, where we focus on the failures that are necessary to be successful on an agile journey, because there are always valuable lessons to be learned from someone else's struggles and stumbles. I'm Jeff Anderson, your host and CEO of Agile by Design. Welcome, everybody, to the next episode of Whiplash Agile. I want to introduce my listeners to Brent Reynolds. I've had a chance to work with Brent a number of years back uh, um, on what I think is probably one of the most ambitious Agile transitions I've ever been a part of. Um, While Brent was there as um, both the managing director of the cards business um, uh, at Capital One, as well as uh, the chief customer experience officer, um, Brent oversaw that transition from, I would say, a pretty traditional, um, uh, pretty uh, compliance-oriented organization um, into one that was typified or, or, or kind of, you know, the organizing metaphor would be, se- would be self-managing teams. And when Brent um, facilitated the transition, he touched every function, which is what made it mo- so interesting. He, he worked with the product teams, the marketing groups. Um, helped bring in the operations teams, legal, uh, finance. Um, it was one of the most interesting partnerships I ever had a chance to be a part of. Um, uh, and most recently, Brent has started his own company, um, uh, Payson Solutions, uh, where he provides strategic uh, data-driven advice, um, everything from credit risk and lending, uh, deep data science, um, using that to help with customer acquisition strategies and providing overall financial advisory. Welcome aboard, Brent. Thank you. Always great to see you, Jeff. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm super excited about this podcast just because um, being candidly, speaking candidly, when I first came to Capital One, I thought I was going to come in and be sort of the organizing, you know, agility expert and have all the answers. And I really felt like I knew what I was doing. And I remember the first conversation I had with you and, and the way you were looking at things, we'll get into that in detail. I was like, Oh, I think I'm going to be learning as much as I'm going to be teaching in this organization. <laughs> <laughs> well, at, at Cap, Cap One likes to be the teacher, maybe too a little bit too much. But yeah, it was. We learned a ton from you, Jeff, and it was uh, and and having people want to be self taught as well gets people engaged more and feeling more ownership for it. Right? That's the best. I think that's the best way to do, go about it. So let's 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 start at um, the work at Capital One. It's it's one of my favorite stories uh, in my book, Organizing Towards Agility. I'm going to assume that uh, people haven't read uh, the book and are, are not familiar with the story. So with that in mind, if you were to go back into the beginning, could you describe where Capital One was as a business, why it was there, and, and what was next? Yeah, absolutely. So we were going through a transition. So I think in um, just before you got there, Jeff, we'd gone through a really rough time. We had a bunch of you know fires to put out, re- regulatory findings. So it was really... Um, not a lot of growth, not a lot of focus on innovation or, or even the customer in like true customer experience, but more fixing customer problems. And so, um, and then as we started to come out on the other side of that, we were going through a digital transformation as a company, like Capital One was one of the leaders. We were, we were the first ma- major bank to go to the public cloud in the US. And we wanted to deliver, you know, more personalized real-time experiences to our customers and really invest uh, in that digital transformation. Uh, but in order to do that, we really need to change the way we work. We need to organize our teams differently. We need to think about how we work in more agile fashion, right? And so we did, like you said, we went very ambitious. We didn't just keep it to the software studio and the product teams, but we decided to scale across the organizations. So you even had like compliance and legal, you know, being part of the agile ceremonies and figuring out how to best enable the business um, and be there, you know, at the right time for the most important things for the customer, right? So that that's a really massive um, shift. If you think that you're coming from a sort of regulatory remediation sort of mindset where lots of discipline, lots of controls in place, um, lots of process, and now it's how to create more personalized experiences. Um, how do, and That's a big job, even just from like an organizational perspective. How did you think about... Um, you know, like what was the big organizing metaphor for you? And how did you go about doing that? Well, the organizing, I'll get, maybe I'll, let me lead up to the organizing. So I think the first thing when you come out of that, we, 
we were very much in a command and control environment before, right? Which you had to be to kind of get through to make sure that people were actually doing the back checking, like sort of the dirty work that we needed to get done and get out of the penalty box, so to speak, right? Um, but then we realized as we were starting to try to grow again, everyone had their own different goals and those goals tend to be by function, right? And that was sort of impeding us. So if you think about a typical bank or any typical large organization even, you have functional units that have different goals and incentives aren't always aligned. And that really impacts your ability to prioritize and, and, and work effectively as a team on customer journeys or customer outcomes, right? So you've got, like we would, like, you often have the business lead or the general manager, and they would be incented by growth targets or profitability targets. You have operations. Operations would typically have quality metrics. You think of that environment we're kind of coming out of. They're like, wait a second, we can't start growing again until we fix the customer problems we have. You've got marketing or product that's probably very focused on the customer. So thinking we got to invest in our mobile app or we got to invest in our digital properties. And then you have tech that's very worried about the platform. And you know, we got to refactor our code base. And so one of the things I wanted to solve for with organizational design is how do you get these teams to be cross-functional, to have shared goals, um, and, and allow them to be self-sufficient as well. So that's when we decided to organize around customer journeys rather than organize around functional units. Um, so that these teams- If you organize be, around functional units, you need the executive to play tiebreaker all the time, right? Because everybody's exactly. got- Exactly, exactly. And, and, okay. and we, you know, we really tried to you know, embrace the kind of you know, organize around the why, leaders communicate the why, and then make the teams as self-sufficient as possible so they can figure out the how and the what on their own, right? Um, and then and then we're always, you know, I was always there to jump in and help, but trying to get them to come up with their own, uh, their own roadmaps, as long as they're connected to what we're trying to accomplish uh, at the top as part of our mission, right? So, so talk more about that, you know, um, this sort of outcome-oriented uh, design. Yeah, so we looked at, we broke down our, our business into, I think it was 12 customer journeys, and then we organized around those, and we had everything ladder up. So I had, in my organization, I had, we, we, we created pods, which would be uh, self, like semi-autonomous teams. You would have like a product owner, you know, maybe a, a few dev, uh, an operations, a data scientist. Um, and then they would be part of what we called a lane, which is like a team of teams. Like very similar, Shopify probably uses different languages, but you know, the Shopify video, that's very, very famous on this. Um, and then so well, maybe a lawyer or a compliance person would be dedicated to a lane. So they would feel part of that broader team and they would have their own ceremonies because you, you, you wouldn't, obviously, it'd be too expensive to have a lawyer in every pod, right? Um and, and then all the lanes that would, would ladder up to like a direct The lawyer recipe. can't just code when uh, he's not. Just- <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we, I found this work really well. And then we'd make sure that everybody had shared goals. So everybody didn't just have growth goals. They also had quality goals. They had compliance goals. They, you know, they had product, uh, efficiency goals, productivity goals. Uh, so each team was kind of like its own little mini business within a business, but everything also layered up too. So no one was going in different directions. They're all aligned towards our overall m- mission of, you know, helping people succeed with credit. I really like the way you showed me, um, I call this now the onion diagram. Uh, and I kind of bring it almost everywhere I go. Oh, wow. Where you had these these teams and you had, um, you know, some full-timers and some travelers. And then you had the lane, which is sort of like the close-knit sort of brother and sister pods. Then you kind of had the line of business, which is more kind of cousins, I guess you could call it. And then finally, it kind of like you had a few people that were global, but like you tried to push everybody as locally as you possibly. If you couldn't put them in the team because not every team needs a lawyer, you try to get them in the lane. And even if the lane didn't make sense, you're like, okay, well, can I put them in the line of business? And then try to minimize the truly kind of shared service concept as much as possible. Exactly. Exactly. And for when you went transition that model, though, there was a, a the. People, it was the hardest for, I think, was the middle management layer because they their identity before had been in kind of gatekeeping. They had individual contributors on their team that would be assigned to different projects. And their role was sort of to like break ties, like you said before, right? Like figure out if Jeff's too busy, I'm his manager. Jeff will point people to come to me and I can kind of tell them that Jeff's too busy. He can't work on that or, you know. And now it was the the teams that were self autonomous. They were making their own decisions. So that middle management layer had to figure out kind of like how do they how do they redefine themselves as kind of craft leaders and not project managers, right? How did you work with um, 
some of the middle middle management. I mean, this ties back to kind of motivating them to behave differently. And uh, what were some of the things either that you had them do differently or, or how did you encourage them to kind of work in this new, in this new model? The most powerful concept that I had, and I, I use this as the basis for a lot of the like leadership and development, uh, you know, offsites or meetings I would have with my leadership team was this concept of uh, first team mindset. Uh, yep. Are you familiar with Patrick Lencioni or some of your listeners probably I are? Am. I'm sure. Um, yeah. Well, I love sure this. Thing you, if, you, if you ask people work like who their first team is, like what's the team that you prioritize? They typically say their own team, right? It's like, okay, if I lead the data science team, I, my first team is the data science team. They're the people I hired. They're the people who are most like me. They're the people I have a strong connection with. They're the people I feel I have to defend. Um, and then like my peer group would be more of the second team. And Patrick says that's the exact opposite. Like a f- high, high, uh, high powered teams um, recognize that your first team is actually your peer group. So these middle managers, rather than battling each other, would work together and then let their teams be more autonomous, right? And so two things happen when you view your first team as your peer group. One is um, you you work for the better for the whole, right? If you build trust with each other, then you're not you're not fighting for your piece of land or, or your priority, right? You're you're creating shared goals with the, within your leadership team and supporting each other. And then two, your team, at first, it'll feel strange to them if you're spending less time with them, they'll, right? But a beautiful thing will happen after a while. Like they'll actually step up and uh, take on more because you're giving them more space and you're kind of actually backing off and not micromanaging them as much. So we would do offsites with my leadership team where we, we would focus on first team, we'd do trust building exercise, and then we'd take whatever our biggest challenge was that was kind of cross-functional across the business and we'd solve it together. And a lot of times that was kind of organizational design to be more agile or like figuring out how to get our, you know, what whatever, like our online banking platform, like, you know. What's the uh, new strategy or the new kind of enablers that you want to put in place? Yeah. Those kinds of things, right? and, and then figure out like what behaviors maybe were, were impeding that, like where were people maybe protecting their own interests at the sake of kind of what was best for the business. And then how do you have like those fierce conversations and kind of like build that trust so you can just solve it and call people out, right? I feel like you've come on another organizing principle, which is if a layer is too big to, to act as a team, you probably need to break it up into a couple lanes because, you know, if you have like 50 middle managers, it's like, okay, everybody, there's really kind of like five units that need to be, five manager teams that need to be created here cross-functionally. So I think you, I, I've never thought of it that way before. So that, that's why I love talking to you because I think I learned something new. But the, the change management, Jeff, is is hard, as you know. I mean, and you faced it too, right? Like um, we got we got a lot of support. Capital One's a pretty progressive company, but even at a really progressive company like Capital One, change management was hard, right? Um, yep. I love- Why well, um, thought they were going to just do it just because we told them to? And, uh, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's the, yeah, I'll get back to that in a second. But I mean, I love- um, Eric Reese in the Lean Startup has a quote that I absolutely love. It's, uh, there's two things that are true in all companies. So one, everybody complains about the status quo. And then two, nobody wants to change. And so that's what I found a lot early on. And so if you think about um, what motivates people to want to change, uh, like they need to feel like they're driving the change. It's not happening to them, right? Um and so, how do you get you, how do you get everyone involved? So we we didn't just train the leaders; we trained the middle level, we trained the junior associates, we trained even trained the people in the call centers. Right? They had we create a lot of agile ceremonies there as well, um, and 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 got them not just trained, but more like sessions where where they would explore and teach themselves and learn themselves, right? And co create. We did a lot of co creation. Uh, yeah, you know, co creation is, is yeah. I think is huge. And again, I don't read many books. I keep quote. I just have a few books. I read one book every five years, but then I just quote the hell out of it. But um, I remember the Dan Pink. He talks about uh, the three things that really motivate people in the 21st century. Right? Are you familiar with this? Right. Yes, very um, much so. So mastery, purpose, and autonomy. autonomy. And yeah, thank great. you. <laughs> I read it five years ago. Like I said, the um, and, and I think that's totally true. So like we we needed to give like allow people to feel like there was a purpose to what we're doing. So constantly reinforcing the why, like it was all about delivering better personalized real-time experiences for our customers, getting NPS up. That was why we're doing this. 
And the way to do that is to deliver more features faster. We're not doing it because someone up on high told us we had to be agile. We're not doing it because we want to like, it, we're not doing it for the capital A agile, if that's a thing that is still talked about, right? It was, it's for agility, not for agile. I, I think the big A agile thing is very much a thing still talked about, although I think we're starting to get good industry rejection of it, which uh, it's good to see that happen more and more. One thing I worry about is people are throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so they're throwing out the small A with it as well. Um, uh, hopefully that survives and you don't, you know. Um, Absolutely. Cut off our face to spite our nose, or is it the other nose? Is it, yeah. Is it another face, something like that. <laughs> yeah, but um, it was always, yeah, it was always principle over practices, right? I think the teams, the more the teams got, they like, got got the fact that it, it's not a religion, it's not a set of rigid tasks, it's uh, it's stuff that's going to make uh, make your life easier. It's going to it's stuff that's going to make you move faster and deli- and put more points on the board. Um, and you can tailor it to the best teams. Tailor their own ceremonies. Tailor their own prioritization. I, f- I always feel like uh, the first sign of agility is when you break stuff. You break the process, not when you follow it. So I don't look for a doctrine. I look for like breakage. Like where did they say, okay, this doesn't make sense for us, and we're going to do something else instead? So yeah. Actually, one question for you, Jeff. I don't know if that's allowed in your podcast. If I can flip it around, uh, but the, sure, let's do it. Let's turn it around. <laughs> with um, with COVID and now returning to work, there's a lot of anxiety out there and angst over companies, you know, forcing people to come back more to work than they're yeah. comfortable with. There was there's huge benefits in being co-located with agile teams, but I think with the global experiment of COVID, we proved that you can also accomplish a lot over video and people can be yep. just as productive or if not more productive in, in a lot of cases, right? How are you finding that transition with the teams that you're working and how has that maybe impacted people's view on 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 how to operate as agile teams? I'm a big fan of, of uh, co-location and, and uh, I still am. I'm now a bigger fan of like, sorry, a bigger, I'm not a bigger fan of distributed work than co-located work, but I'm a bigger fan than I was. Like I was one of those, call me even like, this is one of my agile bigoted sort of like opinions. No, you have to be co-located. You have to be together. And you're right. I've, I've seen some really meaningful work get done in a distributed way. In fact, if you look at all the open source communities and all the hackers and people having fun on Discord and Patreon together. They're building some really amazing things and it's all distributed. Um, so I think if you have meaning and you have purpose and you have all of those things, teams will figure out the right amount of, co- of co-location to meet the outcomes. I think a lot of organizations uh, still haven't figured that out. So they're falling back to just telling their people to come into the office because they feel like it's easier to control everybody. So I don't think... I don't think treating your, if you treat your people like children and like servants and slaves, they will respond. You get childish behavior. Yeah. You get childish behavior. And people are in this almost agentic state where they just do things because. So I don't think you'll ever, I do believe we should be in a situation where there is more co location than there was. But if you coerce it, all you're getting is um, people who are doing it just because. So you're, you're still going to, you're never going to get high performance that way. So I, I I couldn't agree more. Well, that's good. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for reinforcing what I, what uh, what I kind of believe. That makes a lot of sense. Well, I actually hope that, that there's anybody uh, who's listening who has the positional power because a lot of times I'll be working with people at the the vice president or SVP level, and you'd think that would be senior enough to make those changes, but it's these kind of decisions go all the way to the top, right? And so I hope people that are listening to this will actually consider that every time you give an edict, an edict like this, you've robbed people of their autonomy and you've created a condition of low performance. And you'll never, you might, you might stop that issue from happening, whatever it is, but you'll never get the high performance that way. You know? So no, I think my wife, I won't say what company she works for, but they just, they just announced they're moving from three days to four days back in the office and they had two people quit, I think that day. So yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how can you help it? Right. Um, <laughs> let's talk about, um, uh, You've already talked about this a bit, but a lot of people bring this up when I speak to them about change. What do you do with the persistent naysayers um, and um, you know the objectors who are there because they don't know what they don't know, or there's just cultural debt going on or trauma or whatever? Um, people who just sort of can't seem to get into this new kind of style of working, high teamwork, high collaboration. It's not for everyone. Um, 
And how, how have you in a, in a leadership position like this worked with some of those folks? Yeah, I think the biggest thing I'd learned personally, Jeff, was to slow down because you and I have worked together a bit. You, you know, I tend to like jump fast and move fast and, and kind of an early adopter. And I remember we had an offset about three years into our journey and I put the change curve up there. I think Tassie would recommend I do this, you know, like I, whatever the four stages of, ch- of change are, right? Change like curve, denial, right? fear, yeah. acceptance, and optimism, I think. And I was in the fourth one and I got it, people to, to identify, to stand up and say which one they're in. And can you guess what most, the majority were in? Denial or, or fear? <laughs> fear. At, least, at least they were in the first one. They were in the second one. The, the vast majority were in the second one. And this is three years in. And so I'm like, huh, like, you know, I kind of thought some of these people were just naysayers or, or you know, it's sort of like the complainers. I'm like, well, this is how most of the company's feeling. Like everybody's feeling that they're still you know, a ways to, to go. And this is a bigger change for a lot of people than maybe I, I had internalized. Right. So that that's one is just allowing people the time and giving them the space to, to ask questions and, and, and get comfortable so that they feel, again, it goes back to feeling like they're driving the change, not the change happening to them. Cause people will never get past that fear stage. They feel that the change is happening to them and there's somehow an outside observer. Right. So it all goes back to like, how do you get people co-creating? How do you get people part of the solution? Um, and then, I don't know, like not to sound too tough. I'm not really a tough leader, but like, I do believe at, at some point, if people don't get on the bus, maybe, maybe that's time to move on from them as well. Right. Cause you don't want a few people that some like in any organization, you're going to have that bottom 5% or whatever that is going to hold everybody back. Cause they just can't get on the bus. And so I think for high performing teams, you need to make sure you give them every opportunity to feel, uh, to get involved and take ownership. But it's, there, there is a few people that just won't make that leap and, and aren't going to be successful. And then you're better off, you know, allowing them to go and work somewhere else in a different environment that's more comfortable for them, right? I was reading that what Zappos does is they give you a, um, an incubating period. And after the incubating period, they give you a really generous severance if you choose to leave. And they give it to everybody. And most like equivalent to, I don't know what it is, six months pay, a year's pay, something like that. And 90% of the people stay and the people that choose to leave are people that just like, are like, this culture is insane. I can't take this. I'm out of here. And then, and then they think that's, that's, it's, that's, that's actually profitable for them because it means that the people that stay are the people that are wow. on the bus. Basically. That's like yeah. a deal or no deal. It's like a, like a yeah. um, game show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Stay, don't stay. Yeah. <laughs> take the money or go. Talk to me a little bit about, um, you talked a bit about fear. Yep. Um, one of the big, you know, um, drivers, I know because you have an opinion on this, one of the big drivers of fear is failure. Right. And most big enterprises, whether it's finance or medical or whatever, have this, you know, kind of culture of celebrating success or the illusion of success and not talking about the failures. Talk about how you maybe sort of talk about your perspectives on that. Yeah, no, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and you got to remember to go back to the start of our conversation here, the environment we're coming out of was a one of um, almost like institutionalized, institutionalized fear, right? So, so Ryan, Ryan Snyder, who led our, like the whole card business for us card, when we had all of these regulatory findings, once a week, you would have to go and you would have to say, if you had not like closed out like a, like a known customer issue or, or defect and explain uh and go and get your like public floggings right and so people were so scared of like screwing up or or not doing something exactly right by the uh, by the right time so th- so this is what we were kind of faced with um but we had to fix this you have to give people you know especially as the teams get more self autonomous like if i'm telling them what to do and then it it doesn't work out they don't feel that as, as much um personal failure because they were told to do it by me. Right. But if they're now deciding what to do, then it's much bigger fear of failure because it, you know, it's, it's what they, it's what they decide to do. So they take a lot more personally. And so you need to create that culture where you're like, a hey, failure is actually a good thing. Like what's um, I, that quote ever, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. Love it. Uh, I don't know so that one, one thing I did is we, we, yeah, we came, I, we came up with a failure wall and, and now I'm not saying you just like, you just celebrate failures and you stop there. What we would do yeah. is we would put up the failure, but then we'd have the, we'd have like a little retro. We talk about like, well, what did we learn from this? And what are we going to, what's the, what are we going to now put back 
into our workflow to, to tr try this again or to make it better. But we'd actually celebrate those failures. We, we'd get people to clap af after someone presented their failure to the group. So it's rare to see that at the at the at the sort of at that leadership level. Um, uh, I think that's what made some of the big differences in the Capital One sort of Canada Cards transformation than some others is just it started in these principles of safety, teamwork, failure, and then getting those principles and outcomes, then doing the agile stuff as a, as a helper to those things versus the other way yeah. around. You know? and, if, yeah, and if if you look at the last five years, we haven't talked at all about pace. And so this is maybe the only thing I, I can bring up on that, Jeff, but like I work a lot of fintechs now. And if you ask me, what's the yeah. biggest thing kind of like from a personality or the way they work versus like large organizations like Capital One, the single biggest thing I'd say is like fear of failure. Like, like startups have no fear of failure. It, like it's kind of right. by definition, like if you're afraid to fail, you just wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. You wouldn't go start a company because there's so, so many things that can go wrong. Right. And uh, it it's so wrong, hard. Right? Yeah. yeah. It do yeah. go wrong, but they just try, try again. Like, and I think, so I'm sure a lot of what your company does is going to these bigger organizations and say, Hey, you um, like, you're going to, you have a lot of natural advantages over these startups, but the one thing that, you know, that could really help you is to build that culture that they have on having no fear of failure into your large organizations, right? Into their DNA. How did you go about doing that with some of your leaders? Well, obviously the failure wall helped, um, uh, the outcome oriented and the teamwork and the sense of trust helped. Anything else you did that helped, uh, people kind of overcome this sort of cultural environment? Yeah. Of, of and you'd have to ask failure. other people. I mean, I, I could, you know, this could just be all in my head, whether I did this well or not, but I tried to be more of a servant leader, right? Like less of a command and control, like more give them guidance, but like not micromanage them at all, not require like static updates and all of that. Um, and we also focus a lot on outcomes rather than activities, right? Which I think is the right way to go about it if you want to really allow people to experiment and to try things. So we had, remember in our, we had our hub room where we had a lot of our like metrics and we had team design. And so we would focus on the metrics and be like, okay, well, why is like, you know, why are approval rates down for our customers? Um, and then I'd be like, okay, well, go solve that. But I wouldn't say like do A, do B, do C. I'm just like, get, let's get approval rates back up to 60% or whatever, right? <laughs> um, and so I think like working with like OKRs and stuff and um, keeping people focused on the on the why and and the the result that we're trying to achieve, but allowing them to go out and try new things and and, and figure it out themselves. Um, you, that's how you build like your your strong leadership base. Like that's how you really develop leaders. Right? Talk about Payson for a little bit. You you mentioned a bit about um, um, provided maybe an overview of like some of the work you're doing and, and how have you been bringing some of these pr principles and concepts to your teams and even your customers now as part of your own organization that you're running? First of all, why did you decide to go into Payson in the first place and, and kind of make your own thing? That would be interesting to know. Oh yeah. Well, it, like any, like most big decisions in life, it's probably not single faceted, but I think a big, what, one of the things is I had started a, an innovation lab. I think, you know, this in, in Kitchener, Waterloo, and my I would go down once a month and just spend the whole day with them there. And, and, and they, we, they were focused on a lot of, um, there's a lot of data scientists there. So focused on a lot of like new technologies and, and sort of like new use cases. Um, but also part of the experiment was to see how much more productive people would be if we got them out of the meeting culture. So they had almost no meetings, right? They were off the grid. And I would go down once a month and just kind of jam with them. And, and that was like my favorite day of the month. Like driving back from Kishwara, I would always be thinking to myself, wouldn't it be cool if I could do this every day? And so that was one of the things that kind of got me thinking about starting my own business. Um, but with Payson, the contrast, I do get to see a contrast every day because we have enterprise clients. So we, we've worked with all the large banks in Canada, except for one. Um, and uh, and then we work a lot of fintechs around the globe, too. Um, and with fintechs, they don't even talk about agile. Like there's no like organizational, they don't even have organizational design <laughs> for the most part. But they just, they it just happens naturally. You, know, you, you don't need to call it something if it's already just happening naturally, right? So I think... Um, but where I really noticed those with my enterprise clients with the banks, which I'm sure you work with a lot of the banks, um, they're still very function, uh, they're still very siloed, and they still always are. Even their agile teams are, are siloed, like they're all exactly. Good. It's, it's, it's not like we did agile in Capital One. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they they do really well despite themselves because honestly they really they really fight 
we talked about battling business units. I really noticed that at the banks, like they have, uh, um, they have teams there that are always worried if you're talking to another team without them there and, and they have their own, uh, incentives that sometimes are pretty far removed from customers. It's more like their goals are like, how many projects did you complete? Not like how much money did you make the business or what did you, like what impact did you have a customer satisfaction? Um, so I think there's a lot they could learn there, but they're just such big, uh, big beasts. It's going to be a multi-year effort, I think. Right. <laughs> Multi-decade, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, we've been with one bank for, uh, for about six years and we're still with them and we're seeing great progress, but it's in several lines of business versus then the rest of the organization is still there. Right. And, it's, and by it's, the way, I'm not saying there's business. not great pockets, I, 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 I'm not trying to be, yeah. but, but I do notice it. I, the contrast is very obvious when you get to work with both. It's, it kind of just, it, it's when you, when you live, if you've only lived inside that system, it might not be so obvious, but there's, there's work to there, there's wood to chop for sure. <laughs> yeah. In terms of your team at Payson, um, talk a little bit about your team. Like what have you brought with you? Much lighter weight, I guess. And I, like, what are you doing to kind of instill a culture of teamwork and fearlessness and all that kind of good stuff? Yeah, we just had, we were a very small team, by the way. We just had our offsite, and, and the team did say one of the things they liked is just how much autonomy they're given and how much space I give them. Um, we also talked about, and again, a, a lot of this I learned from you, Jeff, in my time at uh, at the ad, do, during the Agile Transformation at Capital One. But I think one of the reason one of the reasons because companies hire pace and like working with pace is that we do move at the speed of fintech right we turn things around very quickly we're very agile um and uh and then very data driven so cap one is one of the best com- companies in the world at taking data and then figuring out how to optimize customer problems right and so we, we're bringing that we're trying to kind of bring that to the rest of the world and like teach them the power of their own data and how they can use that to build like amazing experiences for their customers so love it amazing um, Brent, is there any, um, let me turn the mic over to you. And if there's any, um, thing you want to, um, you know, share with the audience or any personal plugs you want to do, Mike is yours. Oh, thanks. Um, well, uh, I, I do believe, and I think, I don't, I don't know how much of a skeptic I was, I was probably a bit, a bit of a skeptic on, on agile, maybe back 10 years ago before I, we went on this journey. Um, uh, but I've seen it if done the right way, it can, it can really do wonders for not only, um, you know, your business results and how fast you release it, but, but employee satisfaction and engagement, right? Um, Capital One, I know I've five years removed from there, but I still have some good friends on the inside. And I can tell you they've gone from, I think we released two features in 2013, the whole year, right? When we were on the U S tech stack and now, they're they're releasing like hundreds a year, and it's uh, it, and and credit policy change used to take us months and months. I think they're doing in like a couple of days now. Like it's really it's really night and day. Um, so I think it's it's uh, it's a it, one of the reasons the banks probably kind of start and stop, start and stop on agile is because of change fatigue. Like it's hard. It it took us years to get to that point though but if you stick to it you're going to be way better on the other side i think right if people want to uh learn more about you or payson how can they uh connect how can they reach out oh uh my email is simple brent at payson.ca and the website's also payson.ca uh and i'd love any feedback on it because uh we don't have a lot of budget for our website uh but we'd love to hear from you. Fantastic, Brent. As always, it was amazing talking to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Jeff. And uh, and great talking to you as well. And, and congratulations on everything you've done with Agile by Design, your books, and, and uh, all the great impact you're having out there in the market. I really appreciate it. Thanks, appreciate it. Have a great weekend. See you soon. Thanks. You too. Thanks again for joining me on Whiplash Agile. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss a single episode. If you want to connect with me, join me on LinkedIn or Twitter slash X. And if you like what you hear, or especially if you don't like what you hear, get in touch with me directly at agilebydesign.com.